Hey everybody, it's your favorite host, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today we have a phenomenal guest today on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. This man is impactful. Who I have coming to the stage is the award-winning writer, director of the documentary, Leaving God. His name, Mr. John Folis. If you've heard of him, you have to have heard of him. And if you haven't heard of him, he is the award winner of a Hollywood international documentary film called Leaving God, where he shares his experience and his relationship over a course of several years um, of where he was with Christ and, and, and how he documents and records and shares how people over the years have fallen out of love. And more and more, there's an increase of people leaving God. Um, Mr. Folis is an international documentary film writer and was awarded the film explores, his film explores a major cultural shift happening in America. This shift is away from religion and from God. Paralleling this trend is also Mr. Folis shares his fascinating, incredible personal story and where we have the profound ability to interview him today. ABC, BBC describes this as a compelling film and has been seen by over 36,000 people from 98 countries via Venmo, YouTube, and the top documentaryfilms.com website. Before becoming a filmmaker, Mr. John was a, also an award-winning Madison Avenue admin who actually helped sell God. And so today we have the incredible Mr. Fullis, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about his blockbuster film. So help me welcome to the stage, the incredible Mr. Fullis. Hello, Mr. Fullis. This is Marcus Norm from Gentleman Style Podcast Show. Welcome to the stage. Thank you for being here on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show, sir. Hey, my pleasure, Marcus. Great to be here. Great to have you, sir. Great to have you. Thank you for your time and thank you for taking the time today out of your busy schedule to be with us and to share some 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 unique tips on, on and some background about who you are. I read your fabulous bio before coming to the stage here today, but um, tell us what what a little bit about yourself. I see the awards. I see the plaques. Uh, you are honored, sir. You are an incredible man and you've done some incredible works. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for my audience so they can hear it from, from the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that buildup, Marcus. I appreciate it. So I spent my career in the advertising industry, mostly in New York. Um, I, uh, uh, lived in Manhattan and I worked on literally on Madison Avenue and uh, started my career working for some of the top agencies in New York and getting fired from a number of them. Um, it's, uh, it's a very competitive environment, uh, like any major industries, but especially in New York. It's true what they say that uh, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And I believe that's true. And uh, after getting fired a number of times, I decided to switch gears and do more independent projects uh, for smaller companies, smaller clients directly. And uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I attracted a uh, business guy who was excellent at uh, business development. So he was uh, someone that really allowed me and us together to find our own clients and try to build an agency, which we ended up doing. And because he was so good at what he did, finding business, and I was good at doing the creative work, our agency in a very short time grew very quickly, uh, not just with new clients, but clients that allowed us to do the uh, highly creative kind of edgy kind of advertising work that got seen and noticed. So these awards that you see behind me are some of the awards that were won uh, uh, for the clients that we served during that time. And uh, I think it was about three years after we started our agency, we became the second most award-winning agency in New York. And they were like 
I don't know. I think we had at the time we had six employees. So we were beating out agencies that had worldwide networks of thousands and thousands of people in the award show. So it was pretty, that was pretty exciting. That is very exciting. That's huge. So that's what you're currently doing now. Um, no, 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 that was, no. I'm talking okay. years ago. No, that was that, you know, that was, uh, I'm 67 now. That's, we started the agency, I think when I was 33. You look so, good. Yeah. So, um, one of the one of the things that I think I mentioned in my my bio that happened during that time is uh, some of the public service work that our agency did. And on a personal level, I always felt it was important to give back when you were able to do that. So I would always keep my eyes open for opportunities to do public service work. <clears throat> and one of those uh, causes that I really believed in was child abuse prevention. So as a result of an ad that I came up with on my own, we ended up developing a relationship with the National Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse that was just starting to do a, a, a deal with the NBA. Uh, they, they were looking for a way to get their messages out uh, on TV. And at the time, the NBA was willing to give them $5 million worth of their TV media time to do a TV, some TV commercials. So it was just great timing that we happened to connect with this organization right after, I think it was like a day or two after they had agreed to this great deal with the NBA. And this was back in 91, Marcus, so $5 million worth of TV media in 91 is probably worth close to twice that right now, just to give you a perspective of how much. And that that $5 million was not over a year, that was over about a three or four week, <clears throat> excuse me, over a three or four week period, because it was only during the NBA playoffs that they were running these TV spots. So that was a very concentrated period of time that these TV spots were running and, and uh, we were given the opportunity to come up with the TV campaign. And it was so successful, uh, both my partner and I were invited to the White House. At the time, uh, the White House was uh, uh, George Bush, George and Barbara Bush, so George the first. And Barbara's pet cause was, or one of her pet causes was child abuse. So it was, I think it was because of that, that, uh, I guess someone at the, I still don't know exactly how they made the connection uh, from those TV spots to our agency, but obviously someone at the White House was an NBA basketball fan, and maybe it was George for all I know. And maybe he was watching the spots and said, hey, Barbara, you gotta watch these TV commercials. We gotta find out who did that. I have no idea, could have been. But uh, someone at the White House noticed the spots, contact the NBA, ask the NBA what agency was responsible for doing the spots. And next thing I know, I'm looking at an invitation, which I thought was bogus when I got it in the mail and the envelope had a re it. return address is the White House. I thought it was a good joke. Someone's pulling on me. But uh, a month or so later, I was personally invited. And it wasn't just me. It was a bunch of people that at the time, I think their um, their campaign was a thousand points of light, which was their uh, their tagline for people in the country who were doing something that brightened things up that 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 were um, um, cause related that were doing some good works and they wanted to acknowledge those people as part of this thousand points of light campaign and and just say you're doing a good job and honor them at the White House. So I was one of a group of people uh, that was part of that. And it was very exciting. Makes sense. Makes sense. I forgot to mention y'all a true heart of gold. Mr. Folis, so your marketing agency at that time, how did you transition over to filmmaking? Uh, what so, inspired that? Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm talking quite a while ago, uh, 30, 30 years ago, really, um, I continued, you know, and in the 90s, the the marketing advertising landscape changed dramatically because it was during that time that uh, the Internet was 
addressed. So what I'm talking about was just pre-internet, which came on the scene around 94. And um, unlike a lot of my peers, um, I didn't think it was just a fad. I, I paid attention to it. I, I wasn't exactly sure in 90, 1994 what a website was. I just knew that I needed to have one. So I, uh, I worked with some tech people and, and our agency website went up in uh, 96. So we were one of the first agency websites that went up and I continued to pay attention to it and started to change my business. So it was more, more of it, more and more of it became uh, online related. I was helping people uh, with their marketing and their websites. And part of that involved doing video work because shortly after people realized they needed a website, they, everyone had one. Not everyone had great video content on their website. So pretty soon after websites came on the scene, then it became uh, a question of, well, are you taking advantage of digital video to tell your story of your product or service on your website? So I got involved with video in the late 90s. And that was, um, your question was how I got involved with the documentary. That was the genesis of it because I loved just dabbling with, I'm a, I'm a, a Apple guy and uh, iMovie, Became, are you okay, so <laughs> iMovie was introduced with one of the early iMacs, I think in the late 90s. So once I uh, realized that you could take any video or even just some still images, some JPEGs and put, a, put an audio track behind them or, or a narration track and a, a voice track behind them and just do some fun transitions between images or, or, or video content, you could really have fun telling any kind of story. So... I had always fantasized about making a documentary. I, I'm a big fan of Michael Moore's work and uh, Ken Burns and some of the other great documentary filmmakers, but I never really thought I had anything worth making a documentary about until the um, around 2016, when I started doing some research about a topic that I had always been interested in. And that is um, people who had, uh, changed their attitude about religion and God. And that in itself wasn't that interesting because it just became, it, it became a major shift and more, many people were experiencing that, that transition. But what really kind of was the tipping point for me to make my documentary was, was when I discovered that it wasn't just the average population that was kind of changing their attitudes, but more and more priests and ministers were, quote, coming out as non-believers. So that, to me, I thought was a story worthy of considering making a documentary on. And that, like I said, that was the tipping point. I wasn't really sure if I start, once I started it, where it was going, going to go or where it went up. But you know, as well as anyone, sometimes the hardest when you when you're considering a big project or, or looking at a at a challenge that seems kind of daunting, um, the hardest thing to do is take that first step. And sure. for, for me, that was the first step toward making that. And I very quickly realized once I got into it uh, and started crafting this documentary, uh, just through, again, I'm not really a filmmaker, but I, I know how to write. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a writer and I, I'm also a designer. I went to design school. So I have the combination of, of, of writing and design. And as you know, it's really not that hard to learn the editing aspect if you like it. It's actually a lot of fun and I just love doing it. So I realized that just with my limited uh, production skills, I could pretty much or I hoped I could tell the story. And I ended up with a 47 minute film called Leaving God. And a, a great film, a unique film, a powerful film that really stood out. Again, you, you were awarded for this film. And again, 40,000 40, views and growing. And that's, that's no easy task, right? That's, that's, that's like an achievement to, to shine a light. And again, uh, 
what I think some people have even attested that this film, their expectation was, um, is this going to convert me out of religion? And it's actually not, right? It's not that type of film. It's not a exactly. to, to slant you in either direction. Yeah. It's to just share information. Exactly. Uh, absolutely. How long did it take you to make the entire film beginning? Yeah, well, to first end? of all, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, because anytime yeah. you have a documentary and the title is Leaving God, you're going to get people <laughs> who are just going to react. It's 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 a uh, you know, it, I want listen, I'm a marketing guy, so I wanted a title that got a reaction from people. Um, but I didn't want it to be so strong that people just got so turned off by the title that they didn't even bother looking at it, which is why I had a subtitle that said, why so many Americans are, are leaving God and religion, including myself. So as you just mentioned, it was really, I, I approached it like an investigative reporter because I was interested in the topic. I wanted to know why, uh, I knew why I, I, was shifting my attitude, but I was curious to know how similar I was to some of the other uh, people that were going through the same process. So especially when it came to priests and ministers, I was really intrigued about that. So I really approached it <clears throat> like an investigative reporter and, uh, <clears throat> and then weaved my personal story into it as well. So it's really nothing that you can debate because I'm just the sources that I um, I used were, were um, like Pew Research, which was one of the, the most respected research companies in the world that showed the statistics about people uh, leaving church and religion, and especially the millennials now, something like 38% of millennials no longer believe in God. So this is very trusted, reliable research. It's not my, my opinion or my bias. Um, so, um, when I, when I made this, uh, Marcus, I, again, for me, the challenge was just to, almost just to see if I could do it. Because as a creative person, as someone was getting more into video, I just wanted to challenge myself to see if I could create something that I thought was even worth sharing. But uh, this isn't anything that was on Netflix or HBO or PBS. And if you make a film, uh, no matter how good it is or how interesting the subject is, uh, it, it doesn't matter if you can't get people to watch it. And um, my film isn't exactly legal because um, I didn't I didn't bother, you know, hiring a lawyer or a, a, a cop, you know, dealing with copyright issues, because, first of all, I didn't think anyone would see it. So if I took something off of YouTube that was licensed, I didn't really worry about it that much. I just, I just, I just did it. If I got a cease and desist letter, then I would deal with it. You know, <laughs> if I got kicked off of YouTube because of copyright issues, then I would, you know, re-edit it, which is what I did. Um, but I wasn't worried about it because, again, it had no dis distribution. I thought, you know, my family and a few of my friends would watch it, and that would be the end of it. So I was shocked when about uh, four or five months after I posted it on LinkedIn and Vimeo, when uh, all of a sudden over the weekend, uh, views doubled from like 700 views to like 10,000 10, views over a weekend. Right. Now, if you post anything on Vimeo, uh, you can, Vimeo allows you to look at the analytics so you can find out where all the views are coming from. So when that happened, I found out that all the views were coming from a website that I had never heard of called topdocumentaryfilms.com. So, of course, I clicked on that link, and there on their main page was an image of my movie poster with a link to watch it and a really positive, critical review of the film. So... I was blown away. I had no idea how they found out the film. They didn't even ask me permission, which was fine. I didn't care. I was thrilled that they, yeah, <laughs> they didn't say, I guess they figured because it was on Vimeo and it was on um, YouTube that it was public domain. I don't know the legalities behind it, but they, uh, they just posted it on their website. Listen, these are people that if I had begged them to, to, to do it, who knows whether they, they would have said yes or no. But the fact that someone 
there in a decision making capacity, A, stumbled on the film, B, watched the film and C, liked the film. That's what. That's why they decided to post it, and it was specifically because they did that I started getting suddenly thousands and thousands of views from around the world. You could also find out where the views are coming from. And I actually counted uh, that the views came from 98 different countries, which was really pretty cool. Very cool. That's incredible. That's huge. That is no easy task. And how long did it take you to make the film um, beginning to end? Well, I, I'll tell you, it took me about three or four months, which is nothing. If you talk to anyone who who has made a decent documentary, they would laugh if, if you told them it only, or they, they would wonder how good it could be. But you have to understand, I made that film sitting from this chair. Wow. I didn't have a production team. Wow. It was me. I was the writer, the director, the producer, the editor. I did everything on this freaking thing. And um, I took my time, but I worked 24 seven during those, those three months. Once I got into a rhythm, I just, I was obsessed. It was, I was so excited because I could see it coming together. And I would, I would spend the day editing and then go to sleep and look at it the next morning and just see how much it could be improved. So, you know, sometimes you go to sleep and you look at the next day and you, 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 you realize you, you need to improve it. So um, I just I was. Uh, I was just obsessed by my making and I'm a perfectionist. The reason I the reason I won these awards is because uh, I was a perfectionist about the work that I, I, I did in advertising. And I took that same mindset to making this documentary and. Um, uh, again, because it was all, I think maybe I shot of those 47 minutes, I think there was all of maybe a, a minute and a half of, um, of raw video that I actually shot on my, on my uh, camera. Uh, really? But most, most of it was just stuff that I could create from sitting at my desktop. That's incredible. That's incredible. And that's, that's huge because when you all see this film, it, it again, it's not, it's not to sway you in any particular direction, but it's very, very well done. And that perfectionism comes out in the film. I, I'll tell you right now, when I watched it, I couldn't turn it down. I mean, people were talking to me. People, I mean, phone calls were ringing off the hook. If I had a baby, that baby would be in trouble. Because <laughs> I was so interested from beginning to end. It truly is. It, it just grabs you and it never lets you go and it never lets you off the roller coaster until that 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 climactic end, um, which is the unanswered question that he leaves you with. So you guys got to check this film out. It is absolutely just, again, informational. If nothing else, it's very, and it's very detailed. And the work from 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 Mr. Folis is truly a work of art. And sir, you 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 did you did that. You did that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks, Marcus. I appreciate that uh, the great review. I think even though I, I may have been lacking in some of the uh, production skills that most people have when they make documentaries, I think what allowed me to um, compensate for that was the fact that uh, my expertise is, is advertising and, and keeping people's attention. In advertising, you do a 30 second commercial and you have to grab people and in that 30 seconds communicate a message in a way that really uh, not just keeps people's attention, but uh, communicates a message in a, in a very impactful way. So I think because I, I'm trained um, uh, to, to think that way, that I, by applying that same thinking to this film, as you said, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear your reaction to it, that it really kept your intention because that was... That was what I was hoping to do uh, with it. It didn't really matter what I said if I couldn't keep people's attention throughout the film. So I wanted it to be paced in a way where um, I wouldn't allow people to get bored, you know? Never, never. I, I, I never. When you all see this film, um, it holds you um, from beginning to end. It starts off, it, he almost romances you through it. 
and he romances you and then he takes you through it and there's a workup and there's a there's some cliffhangers in there and there's and he along the way he's also sharing his experience personal experience and, and tips so you guys have to find that out you guys have to is there a follow-up film what what's what's coming what's in store next no i i do get that question on occasion this was something that um people say how long did it take you to make it and i answered that by saying three months but i could also answer it by saying 40 years mm. because when i talk about my story it's really based on a 40 year journey from from growing up uh being indoctrinated into religion to uh starting to have questions about religion to then getting back involved with my church in a different way with a different church and being very active in my church and then having uh, some experiences that caused me to ask more questions so um it was it was really uh it was almost like giving birth uh to to something that i felt was very important um for me to say and also to share with, with the public I, I I don't know that um, there's anything else that certainly right now there isn't anything else that I, I feel that strongly about. I'm not saying that I I will never make another film like that, but I think this was very unique for the reasons that I, I just mentioned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You you mentioned that your marketing and advertising company when you first when you first got started and in producing this film, this was this was a project that took off for you due to the great work and the experience and the and the and the knowledge that you have over the years. Um, but you also before before you you took on this project, you had an opportunity um, to sell God. Um, and can you tell us? Can you share any of that with us of on, on on what that was like? Yeah. Well, you know the story because I, I what Marcus is referring to is a um, something I mentioned in the film, which is one of the reasons I thought my interest, my story, unlike many people's stories, my my story was a, a, a bit unique in that um, before I, I decided to detach from my belief in God and my involvement with the church, I was I was very active in a church in New York City for a good 20 years. And I actually uh, met a woman at the church and got married in the church and was very active in many uh, groups was doing a lot of volunteer work for different uh, groups within the church and um, was involved with the church for about 15 years before I got on the radar of the head minister, who um, was interested in talking to me when he found out that I was running my own award-winning Madison Avenue agency because his board of directors had just approved a, a budget, a marketing budget of 150K to do some marketing and advertising for the church. And he was very interested at that point in meeting with me and talking with me about the idea of uh, helping helping the church with uh, with their marketing and advertising. So when he first uh, when I first met with him, I was a bit apprehensive because I had had uh, a couple exper a couple of experiences with this minister prior to this that were not the most positive. And um, with any client our prospective client, I should say, that um, our agency would be introduced to, we didn't necessarily jump at working with them just because they had money to spend on advertising. Before we, you know, we, we, we kept, we, we had a very uh, defined brand for our ad agency that we wanted to maintain. We did great creative work, we did edgy creative work, and we only wanted to work with clients that a understood that brand and valued that brand of doing edgy attention getting work so just the way that minister was interviewing me i was also kind of interviewing him to decide whether or not i thought this would be a compatible collaboration and i i wasn't i wasn't sure and it's kind of funny because i initially 
I, I knew that they were talking to some other people. And um, I don't know, I think I was a little, on a subconscious level, I think I was a little bit um, pissed off at him because of something that happened prior to that. So when I, he didn't know that I knew that he was talking to other people. And when he said, so are you interested? My reply was, and I have to laugh now when I think back on it, my reply to him was, uh, let me ask you, are you working, aren't you working uh, talking to another person? And I actually knew who this other person wa was and they were not that good. Wow. So, uh, because this, this was a woman who had actually, um, just a few months prior had come to my, my agency looking for work as a copywriter. So I had actually, I knew this woman because a few months prior to that, I was sitting at a table with her, looking at her portfolio to decide whether or not she was worthy of some, some freelance work from our agency. And I didn't think her work was that good. So it was kind of a unique perspective I had. And when I knew that uh, he was talking to her as well, my response was, well, if you're talking to someone else, why don't you hire them? And if it doesn't work out, then you could come back to me. <laughs> what? what? It's like, shoo. Go, go, go work with her and find out. I, and then... You know, I, I think back on it, Marcus. And again, I, I have to laugh because it was, it was a pretty outrageous thing for me to say. And again, it might have been because I was a little bit ticked off at an experience I had with him uh, years ago. But I think also, as I, as I kind of analyzed it, I wanted to kind of test his um, enthusiasm because I just spent 30 minutes with him sharing all our agency's work and he got to see all the awards that were hanging on our wall. And I didn't want to, I didn't want, if he thought that that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough to convince him that we were the agency to work with, then he could go ahead and work with someone else. That was the attitude kind of that I had. Sure. And his reaction was like, I kicked him in the nuts. It, we, I mean, he just, he just looked at me and, and he couldn't believe what I said. And he said, no, I want you to give us a proposal. I mean, he was, he was, he was adamant. Adamant is a very, great word for it. it so I told strange. him, I said, I, at that point, I said, let me, let me think about it. I'll get back to you in a couple of days. <laughs> the follow-up kick, the, the, the follow-up kick in the, in the nuts. <laughs> I want, I just wanted him to respect that we were a top agency and we didn't need his business. Mm. Now, the, the subtext of that is that I was thrilled at the possibility of working for this church because even though I had had a real, uh, an experience with him that kind of ticked me off, I was passionate about this church. I love this church. Uh, I, I was involved with it, at, like I said, for 15 years. And I was just, I felt so fortunate that I had a place like this so that I could go every week. And I had so many friends there and I went on many weekend retreats and, and I was really tightly bonded to, uh, to this church in many ways. And the idea of having the op opportunity to, to do an ad campaign for this church was thrilling to me. I just didn't want to reveal that to him. You gave up. Yeah. That's your, your Trump card. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I told him I'd think about it. And of course, a couple of days later I said, sure, I'd be happy to give him a proposal. And beyond just a proposal, you know, when someone says they want a proposal, usually it's a marketing proposal or a media proposal, which is how, how that money would be spent. You'd spend it on uh, billboards, you do subway posters, you do it on, you know, radio or TV, you know, whatever that you think would be the best marketing mix for those dollars that would make it the most effective. But I knew that if I really wanted to win the assignment, it would help if I showed him some creative work, even though he didn't specifically ask for that. And quite honestly, Marcus, I, I couldn't stop myself from thinking creatively because I knew the church so well. And I, I just the ideas were just sparking all over the place. And, and the ideas were just like these one liners, you know, these just one liners that would be on a poster that would get attention uh, that reflected what the church was about and then would have the information about 
you know, their services on Sunday or their phone number, their, their uh, website address. So their, their coffee connection. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of the headlines was they, they had a great coffee hour. Um, and uh, one of the things I would look forward to every weekend was the coffee hour. Sometimes I would just skip the sermon. I'd go directly to the coffee hour. <laughs> So, because for me, it wasn't so much the sermons and the biblical stuff. It was the, the fellowship and the connections and my friends that would all be at the coffee hour. So one of the headlines I had was, our coffee hour is happier than most happy hours. <laughs> Marketing genius. I mean, it was just a simple thought. Sometimes it's not what you say, but how, not only what it is what you say, but it's not only what you say, it's how you say it. So to be sitting on a subway, right, and you see a poster that's two feet by three feet, and you look up and you see something that says, our coffee hour is happier than most happy hours, you're going to think, what the heck is that? And, <laughs> you know, if you're at all open to the idea of checking out a church, you might consider at least checking out the coffee hour. Right. And, and yeah. you know, get, getting, getting, your, getting your, your, yourself in there on a Sunday, which is not an easy thing to do. You know, when you're talking to jaded New Yorkers, I can tell you uh, as, as someone who lived there for years, you can think of a lot, lot of things you'd rather be doing on a Sunday morning than going to church. Right. So uh, you have to uh, be a little bit playful. You have to be a little bit irreverent if you wanna get in uh, the minds of a, of a 20 or 30 something New Yorker. And I think, uh, I think the minister was smart enough to appreciate that even though he didn't totally understand, I don't think he completely got my sense of humor or my attitude. And that was just one of the, the posters. Another headline was, uh, you don't have to be a sinner to attend our church, but it helps. Because listen, you know, here, imagine being a, a, a 23 year old guy who was just doing whatever on Saturday night, right? And all of a sudden, um, you got to put up something on a post that is going to get him to think about going to church on Sunday. Not an easy, not an easy task. Not at all. So if you can put a smile on his face and, and talk to him in a way that he, he can appreciate, you don't have to be a sinner to attend our church, but it helps. Basically saying, we don't care what you did on Saturday night. We'd still love to have you on Sunday. I, I think that's something that you say, okay, this, this is a cool church. That's essentially the reaction that I wanted to get uh, from the audience. And, and listen, the minister told us, that was, that was the directive that he gave us, Marcus. He said, listen, we specifically want to target younger people because we know that's the future of our church. If we want to continue to go to this church, we've got to, and it's, we don't see a lot right now, we don't see a lot of younger people in the pews at our church. So if you can do something that's going to get younger people to consider coming to church, uh, that would be great. Yes. Uh, the most successful, I'll just mention one more, Marcus, yeah. because this was the most successful one. One of the things I loved about this church is the many groups and activities and programs that, that they had. I, I, I don't know that there's any church in New York that had as many interesting programs and activities. If you were, um, an entrepreneur, they had an entrepreneur's group. If you were divorced, they had a divorce recovery group. If you were gay or lesbian, and I'm talking the 90s, Marcus, the Even late 90s, then. they had a, a, a LBGT group back then. They were really ahead of their time. So they had about two dozen groups and activities. So you may not want to be going, be that interested in, in the biblical stuff, but maybe you just went through a divorce and you're looking for some comfort or some support, or you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for a way to you know, com you know, hang out with other entrepreneurs or whatever you might be, that um, I thought it was important to showcase the fact that our church uh, isn't just about Bible and scripture, it's about many other things that can serve your needs. So because these posters were big, I wanted to list all these groups. And just the question was, well, what's the headline? And the headline I came up for, um, for that was, if you're looking to feed your soul, we've got a great menu. Mm. 
And then I listed in three columns, all the groups and activities. So if you're sitting on it, you know, that's not going to work on an out, out, outdoor billboard maybe, but if you're sitting on a subway for, for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, you have an opportunity to look up and really scrutinize the list of groups and activities and maybe find one that would make it worth your while to check out. So even that, if you that, weren't necessarily doing it, if I wanted to become an entrepreneur, if I wanted to, if I had questions about entrepreneurship, yeah. Or if you weren't that into church, yeah. you know, I wanted to, to, to attract people uh, to the church any way possible. And whenever you're selling any kind of a product or service, you look at what are those product benefits, right? And most churches didn't have the, that benefit the way this church did. And I thought that I absolutely had to showcase. I thought that was one of their biggest benefits. And uh, again, a subway poster was the perfect media buy to showcase that because you have a, a, a captured, literally a, a, a captured uh, audience sitting on a subway for 10 or 15 minutes uh, that can really respond to a list of groups like that. And the headline, if you're looking to feed your soul, we've got, got a great menu, was just a great way to introduce all those groups. and that. That group, that ad, I think was the most successful one that we did. Incredible, incredible. Mr. Folis, you asked a very important question and this is the cliffhanger. Again, you all, if, if you're watching this right now, you have to check out this film. It is, again, it, 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 it grabs you, it takes you 3000 feet, it drops you a little bit and then it brings you back up again and it's just, all through and through. You asked a very important question at the end. And I wanted to ask you this live or wanted to ask you this. Did you ever get your answer to that question? Well, do you want to share what the question was? Or do you I, want can. To, I can. Or you want to challenge me to try to remember <laughs> it because I don't want to get it wrong. It was a big question. And if I don't get it exactly right, I'm going to screw it up. Is God real was the question. And you asked this question. And no, it was, no, no, that was not, that was not the question. Not that one. No, oh. that was, that was, uh, this is why I wanted to, I wanted to, um, oh, I should say why I didn't want to try to have to remember it because yeah. that's a question. If you don't get it exactly right, you're going to piss off a lot of people. Right. Um, that may have been how you interpreted the question. And I could certainly understand um, if, if you did. I, I don't want to give away the film, actually. That's fair. That's uh, and fair. and, and uh, what you're talking about, I think, is kind of the climax of the film. Because after I, I take the viewer through this whole roller coaster of events uh, that I experienced in my life, uh, doing this church campaign and then some things that followed up that getting kicked out of a bagels and Bibles kind of a thing. I won't go into that, but that was kind of a fun thing where it was a Bible study that I kind of got kicked out of um, that I, I found myself reflecting on all these experiences and really um, asking myself a lot of question, a question. And I think many people these days are asking themselves is, um, um, did, did, did God make us or did man create God? Mm. You know, that's really the question that I was asking because I was taught that God made us, but after going through a lot of experiences and doing the research that it did, you know, throughout all my 40 years of my life, I began to uh, make the comparison to the Wizard of Oz. For anyone who has seen the Wizard of Oz, there's a scene at the end of the movie where Dorothy and her cohorts are returning to the great and powerful Oz um, after killing the wild, the, the wicked witch Wait. of the West. I'm trying to re re get, get my, my <laughs> It's my a classic. Right. It's a classic. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't want to screw it up. So there they are um, now reporting, thinking that they had accomplished and done the task that the wizard had given them uh, and returning with the broomstick to prove that they had killed this and 
Um, I think that the, I don't recall it exactly because they haven't seen the film recently, but I think there was something that still did not please the, the wizard enough because, oh, this was it, because he had promised them that if they, if they wanted to return for Dorothy's, Dorothy's whole thing was she wanted to go back home, go back home. right? And the task that the wizard gave her to, to, in order to enable him to give his powers to send her back home would be that she had to do this test, which he really thought she was never going to be able to do because that wicked witch was pretty powerful, right? Right. And her minions. So he said, yeah, go ahead and kill the wicked witch. And then we'll, we'll talk about getting you back to, to, uh, to Kansas. So in that scene, he was not expecting her to come back with the broomstick of the, of the dead witch. And then kind of um, backstepped a little bit and said, well, uh, I don't, again, I don't remember the words, but I just remember him saying that he still wasn't able to get her back to Kansas. He kind of, you know, um, reneged on that promise. And that's when, of course, Toto wanders over to the side and pulls <laughs> back the curtain and sees that this great and powerful Oz was nothing more than an old white guy pulling some levers, <laughs> right? He's just like us. Yeah, he's just like us. You... <laughs> well, he's just like me. <laughs> so, right. so, um, so, you know, he, it, it turned out to be uh, totally bogus that there was, there really wasn't contrary to what they had believed all this time. There really wasn't any great and powerful Oz um, and she ultimately realized that she had the power all along to get back home, to, to achieve her, 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 her heart's desire. She did not have to rely on the, quote, great and powerful Oz. And the question I asked is, um, maybe when it comes to, to God, maybe the same is true for me and everyone. That, that was the question. It was, you know, is that true? That analogy when it comes to uh, God, is there, is there an analogy there for me, for my life, and maybe for all of us? So it's not exactly, is God real? That's, that's more blunt that I said it. I'm just saying, is there, is, there, is there an analogy between what happened in The Wizard of Oz to... Um, the perception that I have of God and a perception that uh, many people have of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, I didn't mean, answer that. I just said, you know, is, is there an analogy there? And I didn't say, yes, there is, or no, there isn't, because I don't want to, I, I, I don't know, you know, basically I, I'm, I don't claim to have all the answers. I, I, the only thing I claim, uh, Marcus, is to have the questions. <laughs> Yes, sir. How can we connect? How can we learn more? How can we watch the film? How can people find you and your great work? Well, thank, thanks, Marcus. I appreciate you asking that. Um, I think if you just type in the words leaving God in Google, at least when I did it, it came up. Um, it might help if you put the word film or documentary after that. It will definitely come up if you put in leaving God film or documentary. So that's probably the easiest way because it's, it's multiple spots on the internet. Like I said, Vimeo, YouTube, and top documentary films. But Google, those, those two or three words in Google, I think will we'll get you there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Follis. This episode has been truly epic. And this, I appreciate you for taking the time to speak with me and share with my audience today on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I want to say it's a true honor to have you here. And thank you again so much, sir, for your great work and sharing your information. Well, it's been a thrill, Marcus. I really appreciate you having me. And I appreciate uh, the, um, the very positive words you shared about the film. I, I do appreciate that. Glad you enjoyed it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. And I want to thank you all, my audience, for tuning into the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I hope this this inspires, and I hope this is informational, and it 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 shows you 
a wide array of, of, of viewpoints and vantage points and perspective, right? Again, Mr. Folis has done an, an amazing job putting this work and putting the information out there. Um, we can do nothing better than honor him by taking the time to view it and make the decision for ourselves. So thank you, Mr. Folis. Thank you for your time. Like I always end every show, take care of your families. I hope this helps. Take care of your family, take care of your friends, and always, always take care care of business. This is Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show and Mr. John Polis signing off. Love you guys. Bye.